Wellington and everybody else. We're glad to have you with us this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship. I'm delighted to have you watching with me. And if you aren't able to watch live, then just know that the sermon will be on our website um, later this afternoon, hopefully sooner than later. And uh, you can also find some beautiful musical meditations by Rhonda Robinson um, uh, to, to help get your hearts ready for worship. I suggest you try to do that and listen to those before our worship. But um, we're glad you're here. And we're going to begin our worship this morning by inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit with us as we light a candle. And the candle, the light, represents the presence of God with us as we worship this day. Let's begin with an opening prayer. Let's prepare our hearts. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this community of faith, now so much larger than ever before, but united, Lord, in our love for you. And as we worship together this morning virtually, we just give you all the thanks and praise and pray that you would help our hearts and ears to hear what you would have us to hear and that our spirits would accept your teachings. We ask this this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first lesson this morning, I've tried to shorten it, but it's kind of long. Again, it's a story. It's uh, from the book of Ruth, the first chapter, um, verses 1 through 8, 14, and 16 through 21. I hope you can follow along in your Bibles. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kalyan. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpha and the name of the other Ruth. When they'd lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kalyan also died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab for she had heard the in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she'd been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. And all God's people said, Amen. Our psalm this morning uh, is also a psalm of lament. It comes from Psalm 88, again, selected verses. But I, O Lord, cry out to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. 
Oh, Lord, why do you cast me off? Why do you hide your face from me? Wretched and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am desperate. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dread assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. From all sides, they close in on me. You've caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are in darkness. And now our gospel lesson from Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 31 through 33. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat and what will we drink or what will we wear? Or it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And as our people said, thanks be to God. Amen. As I look at my uh, comments this morning, I see that Bo and Ann and Miranda are here, Kathy Davis and Temple, Sherry Rollison, Dolores Cutzer, Linda Sanborn, uh, Debbie Garber, Lisa Sheridan, good morning, Pam Thomas, and happy birthday, Gary, uh, Stephanie Beasley, Gail Hendricks, Betty Snows, Sandy Alberti made it this morning, oh my goodness, good to see you, we're so glad to have you all here and commenting to let me know that you're here, it just means so much to me to to see your names and feel like I'm, I've got a congregation out there that's actually listening to me this morning, so thank you for that. I don't know if you've ever heard of Gary Smalley. He's a, an author and a prolific author, but he tells a story about two moose hunters in Northern Canada. Um, now, they shot a really big moose, okay? And you'd think they'd be good, but it really gave them a serious problem. It was too big to carry out on their pack horses. So they decided to call in a seaplane and they brought the guy in and the pilot looked at the moose and he said, you know, I don't think I can take off with that much weight. Oh, don't worry about it. They said, we've done this before. Don't worry. So they strapped the moose to the pontoons and again, the pilot looked and he said, you know, I know how much weight my plane can hold and look how low it's sinking in the water with that moose on it. I just, I just don't think I have enough lift to take off. Oh, trust us, they said. Don't worry about it. We've done this before. It's going to be fine. So finally, the pilot agreed. He gunned his engine, took off down the runway of water, and crashed into the treetops <laughs> at the end of the lake. Debris flew everywhere. The moose carcass got hung up in the tree branches of a tall pine tree. Down on the shoreline, one day's hunter called out to the other, Hey, George, how did we do? Well, George replied, we're about 50 feet farther than last year. You'd think they'd learn from their mistakes, wouldn't you? I mean, we all fail sometimes, but it doesn't have to be a permanent condition. I mean, if we learn from our failures, we can use them to become opportunities and, and receive wonderful blessings. Our Old Testament reading today gives us an example of just how to do that very thing. It's a story that begins with failure, but ends with a blessing, a blessing greater than anybody could have imagined. It's the story of Ruth. Now, Ruth's story begins back in the days of the judges when chaos ruled the world. And there was a famine. It had come to the town of Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And this Famine caused Elimelech to take his family, leave their home, and journey to the land of Moab, hoping they would find food there. They left Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. They left Judah, which means the place of praise. And they went to live in the pagan country of Moab. And they encountered a famine of a different kind. Isn't that what happened when people try to run away from their problems? You know, people who have problems may actually try to move to a new location thinking that they'll leave all their problems behind them. But 
you end up taking your problems with you. Um, others try to escape through alcohol or drugs or pornography, and some just bury themselves in their work. In fact, none of that works because the problems are still there. All you've done is maybe postpone dealing with them. And sometimes trying to escape from our problems makes them worse. And so it was for Elimelech and his family. Their problems got worse. Naomi and her husband and their two sons, Malon and Kalion, settled in Moab. And eventually their sons married two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And so they were um, ready to, to, to have a new life and begin again. And you think that would be a really good thing. But God told his people not to intermarry with pagans. They knew He knew what would happen when they did. That's back in Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter. And sure enough, not too long after that, tragedy struck. Elimelech died. And Naomi's two sons died. So here we have Naomi dealing with the pain of three deaths. She's a widow, a widow with no living sons to take care of. Her. And, you know, women back in those days had no status, um, no economic power except through their husbands and sons. They were powerless, and widows with no sons starved. So a household of three widows was a pretty hopeless situation. Naomi felt she had no options. She was too old to remarry. She couldn't support herself. She just wanted to go home. She wanted to go back to Bethlehem by herself. She knew her daughters-in-law had another way out. They were young. They could remarry. They could go back and live with their parents until they did. So she told her daughters-in-law, go back, go home, live with your mom. May God treat you graciously as you treated your deceased husbands and me. And may God give you each a new home and a new husband. She blessed them. And then she kissed them goodbye while they all cried. But her daughters-in-law wouldn't leave her. And so Naomi tried another time. She said, Look, God doesn't like me anymore. God's hand is against me. Can't you see that being with me is a spiritual disaster? Can you hear the bitterness and disappointment in her voice? I mean, she was hurt. She was angry. She was confused. And so she challenged God. She no longer trusted God and didn't want to hear any of these cl cliches about how good God is and how God's going to take care of her. Later on in the chapter, she says, my life is trash and it's all God's fault. I'm ticked off with God and his ways. And she said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because my life has been bitter. I had everything when I left. but The Lord brought me back with nothing. How can you call me Naomi when God has turned against me and made my life so hard? Naomi was disappointed with God disappointment. What does that immediately bring to mind? All sorts of situations, right? I mean, sometimes you get to work on a project and all these people commit to help you and then they prove unreliable. They don't show up. And then you plan this family get together, a big reunion, everybody's all excited and going to come. And then at the last minute, they back down and nobody shows up. You have all these goals and dreams for your life. And then one day you realize that you'll never realize it disappointment. It's a part of life. People let you down. Bad things happen. But hopefully you don't quit. You try again. But what happens when you get disappointed with God? I mean, that's how Naomi felt. And she didn't hesitate to tell the whole world about it. She blamed God for all her problems. You know, there are times when we blame God when things fall apart. Uh, Philip Yancey writes about how he was contacted by a television producer uh, after Princess Diana was killed. And the people wanted him on the show to explain how God could possibly have caused such a tragic accident. And Philip Yancey asked the producer, could it have had something to do with a drunk driver going 90 miles an hour in a narrow tunner, tunnel? How exactly was God involved? And from this, Nancy reflected on what a universal problem it is. 
uh, such as when the boxer Boom Boom Mancini killed a Korean boxer in a boxing match. The athlete said in a press conference later, sometimes I wonder why God does the things he does. In a letter to a Christian family therapist, a young woman told about dating a man and becoming pregnant, and she wanted to know why God would allow that to happen to her. In her official confession, when South Carolina mother Susan Smith pushed her two sons into a lake to drown, she said as she did it, she went running after the car as it sped down the ramp, screaming, Oh God, oh God, no, why did you let this happen? Yancey raises the decisive question by asking, what exactly was the role God played in a boxer pummeling his opponent, a teenager abandoning her virtue, a mother drowning her children? God lets us choose, and we did, and our choices have brought continual pain and heartache and destruction. Our self-destructive bent has seemed to know no bounds. Yancey inspires us to ask, what exactly is the role that God plays when we turn our backs on God and run away to Moab? Well, you know, that might cause some people to blame Naomi, criticize her for blaming God. And, you know, emotional pain that goes untreated can poison even the strongest Christian. They may wear a smile at church, but harbor bitterness deep down. You know what bitter people do? Bitter people blame other people for their troubles. Naomi, in her bitterness, took no responsibility for her problems, her choices. She and Elimelech chose to move to Moab. When they did, they moved outside of God's will for their lives. But Naomi blames God. Three times we hear her anger. Ruth 1.13, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Ruth 120, the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Ruth 121, the Almighty has afflicted me. But rather than criticizing her for her attitude, we might stop and realize that what she was really doing was shouting for help. Listen again to the verses of Psalm 88, but this time from the message. I'm standing my ground, God, shouting for help. At my prayers every morning, on my knees each daybreak. Why, God, do you turn a deaf ear? Why do you make yourself scarce? For as long as I remember, I've been hurting. I've taken the worst you can hand out, and I've had it. Your wildfire anger has blazed through my life. I'm bleeding black and blue. Uh, you've attacked me fiercely from every side, raining down blows until I'm nearly dead. You made lover and neighbor alike dump me. The only friend I have left is darkness. The psalmist shows us that Naomi wasn't the only person to rail like God like that and get away with it. I mean, when we're going through times of disappointment, when we feel stuck, when we feel like God is far from us, it's okay to shout at God. I mean, God didn't strike Naomi down and he didn't strike the psalmist down and he's not going to strike us down. What God will do is welcome us back with open arms again. Because God never abandoned us. God never moved away from us. God never went anywhere. We're the ones that moved. The first chapter of Ruth teaches us that first, follow God, not food. We can't put our physical needs above our need for God. We've got to trust God to provide for us. And let God try to solve our problems instead of trying to solve them ourselves. The second lesson we learn here is that um, we got to take responsibility for our choices. We can't blame God when we suffer the consequences of our own actions. There's a third lesson here. One, and, and that's this. Our life choices make a difference in the lives of others. They can change them. You know, Naomi's life changed the lives of the people around her. And our life can have the same effect on the people around us. Why did Naomi impact the lives of her daughters-in-law so much? Well, I think there's two reasons. The first is character. You know, when Naomi first got to Moab, 
She was very different from the rest of the people there. She worshiped God. And this showed in her actions and her words, her attitudes. We don't hear a lot about how Naomi behaved in scripture, but it's safe to assume that her life was so unique, so attractive, that her daughters-in-law wanted to emulate her. That's why they wanted to stay with her. We can have that kind of impact on people around us. But in order to do that, our lives have to be markedly different from the world around us. We have to live like Jesus. We've got to love God with all our hearts and souls and minds and strength. We have to love our neighbors as ourselves. And then people can't help but notice. The second impact comes from time. The big reason Naomi was able to impact Orpha and Ruth so strongly was because she lived with these younger women. They shared a house. They were members of the same family. They shared meals. They worked side by side. And over the days and months and years, Naomi's life influenced the lives of Orpah and Ruth. What Jesus did with the disciples, didn't it? He lived with them. He ate with them. He showed them how he wanted them to live. If we want to have an impact on people, then we have to be willing to be with them, to spend time together, to, to live life with them. And the place to begin is with our own families. Hopefully, during these days of social isolation, you're already seeing the effects of this. This pandemic has allowed us to spend more time with our family, sharing meals together, cooking together, playing games together, putting puzzles together, gardening, many, many other ways. But you know, the pandemic has also created isolation. And God can use that for good as well. Now we have the opportunity to contact people that we don't usually contact. Email, text, phone calls, visits outside in the yard like our Fun Friday Fellowship Tour. Anything that we can think of to remind people how much you love them and how much God loves them. Naomi had that kind of impact on Ruth. Ruth was willing to leave everything she knew, her home, her family, her religions, and go with Naomi to Bethlehem. In verses 16 and 17, we hear the verses that everybody knows and quotes mostly at weddings. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well as even death parts me from you. You know what Ruth is doing here? She is making a clean break with her past. She's burning her bridges behind her. She's committing herself fully to Naomi and to Naomi's God. And there's nothing more for Naomi to say. She can't talk her out of that because Ruth had made up her mind. She'd counted the cost and she'd made her commitment. And they went back to Bethlehem together to food and to family. You know, even though this book is called the Book of Ruth, it's really the story of how God took care of Naomi. Naomi's bereavement gets mentioned the most often and the eventual happy ending of the story. When the neighbors come bringing their good wishes, it's Naomi that they congratulate, not Ruth. So Ruth's improbable devotion to Naomi turns out to be the way that God saves Naomi from her despair. We all go through failures and setbacks in life. We all suffer challenges, especially during this time of COVID-19. And it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get bitter, to lose all hope. But our God specializes in the hopeless, doesn't he? This short book of Ruth reminds us that God is in control. Our God can turn our failures, our famines into joys and successes. We can't give up and we can't let others give up because we have a God that never gave up on us. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us to face whatever challenges come our way with courage and strength. And we, when we can't see around the corner, help us to remember that you're there already waiting for us with a powerful plan, a plan filled with your grace and your love. Help us not to lose hope. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Now it's time for us to go and uh, look at our prayer list this morning. I have some new ones for you. I got a, a text this morning from Mark Johnson. Mark and Lori used to go to our church before they moved. And they're the proud grandparents of a little boy named Waylon Shoal Davis. They're over the moon. Uh, we've had some recent grandparents uh, in our congregation, and they understand that joy. But little Waylon failed his hearing test. So pray, please, for this little child. Uh, I have a joy, too, to say that my son, who had contracted COVID-19, is symptom-free, and we're waiting on the results of the next test to show, hopefully, that he's COVID-19-free. So I'm very grateful for that. Remember um, Tom, who's getting physical therapy for his back pain, and for Sonny Albardi, who was uh, extubated, love that word, and uh, a hard procedure, but a joyful one to know that he's now breathing on his own. He's got that chest tube out. Ron Baxter is suffering back pain again, but he's been back to the doctor. Thank you, Ron. And um, let's see, Paige Green still in a rehab facility. Pray that she does better and gets stronger. Also, I had a new request from a fellow quilter, Nancy Peterson, who moved out to Colorado uh, to be near family when her husband got a brain tumor and Parkinson's has now contracted breast cancer. So remember Nancy and her family. Remember Sherry's brother, Marvin Gallup, who's in uh, Curtech rehab. Uh, Maureen Turner still suffering pain from her knee replacement. We miss her Bible study. Um, Linda Sanborn has a praise. All of her tests were negative. Uh, we are so grateful. And now we're going to go on to the next step for that. Um, Jason Pugh, uh, Linda Sanborn's best friend, Letty's son, had both legs amputated. And he now has come back from his despair with hope and is looking forward to getting a, a dog. Uh, I forgot what you call him. Therapy dog. And uh, a dog that will help him as he learns to walk with prostheses. George Kendall's got some surgery coming up. So keep him in your, your prayer. Jeff Green had his hip replacement surgery, so we're real grateful that that came out so well. He was in a lot of pain, but now he's looking forward to back surgery. So keep praying for Jeff and for Melanie. Um, Donna Blankenship battling her cancer. Uh, Dawn Gregg, her sister, has a broken ankle. Uh, Robin South's sister, Dawn Gregg, has a broken ankle. And uh, Dave Block one is dealing with ALS. That's Larry and Catherine Blaze. Um, Becky Midget lost her faithful companion, Champ. Champ turned 14 on July the 1st, and then she had to put him down. He just couldn't get up anymore. He wouldn't have lived that long if he hadn't had such a mama that loved him so. So please pray for Becky's broken heart. And Anna Reeves is Phyllis Miller's cousin, and she needs prayer as well. I uh, can't remember if I said Jack Peden or not when we came in. So many, so many needs, so many prayer requests, and yet joys, too, amongst all of this. So we covet your prayers as we um, lift each of these people and remind them, not just in our prayers, but physically call them, tell them that you love them and that you're praying for them and encourage them. So um, let's go to God in prayer this morning. Father God, we are so grateful for the many blessings that we have during this time. It's easy, Lord, to get overwhelmed by our failures, to look at all the things that we don't have, all the things that we cannot do, instead of to look at the opportunities we have. You present us, Lord, with choices each and every day. Help them to be good choices, Lord. Help us go the right way, to choose the way you would go. And by doing so, help us to be a witness to the people in our lives. We lift up each and every name on our prayer list and each and every name in our hearts, Lord. There's so many, but we know you hear us and we are strengthened knowing that you've got this, God. Help us to be strong and remind us of your love as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I want to thank you again for your generosity. You have been so good in continuing to send in your tithes and offerings. When we don't meet physically, we are missing many of those donations that come on the spur of the moment on a Sunday morning from people who are not members or who do not tithe. So um, you, you're helping to support us and to keep the church going, and we thank you. And, and I thank you also for the generosity of spirit that you have during these difficult days. We all want to gather again together, but we also want to be safe. So continue to keep your chins up, keep your faith up, keep your hope up, and let's work together as the body of Christ in the world. Um, before I, I do the benediction, I want to see who else has come in this morning. There's Ronnie Sue, the cat. There's the Hildebrandt. Hey, Sharon. Mark. Oh, gosh. Mark is here. Uh, we're praying for little Waylon. Pat Hansen, Evelyn Ireland, and there's Robin and Scott, and Becky Bauer, good morning, Catherine Gillette, and hi, my son says, hey, Ma, <laughs> hello, hug, um, so thank you all for tuning in this morning, I encourage you, please, to share this video with, put it on your Facebook page so others might see it, and uh, I'll just tell you one little phrase for me, I got an email this morning through our website, from a Catholic sister who thanked me for my sermons and asked to be put on our mailing list. So it just brings my heart so much joy to know what an impact you can have on people that you never thought you would touch. And, and that's true of our very lives, isn't it? Not just here on Facebook. So keep up the good work and go now in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and go with love. I love you all. Take care and God bless. Amen.